It is with pleasure that Sport Air presents this video on the basics of fabric covering. Our company has been presenting aircraft builders workshops throughout the country for a number of years. Our objectives have always been and remain with this video to provide you with the technical skills and confidence to start or to complete your project. Covering your airplane is not a difficult thing to do. This video used in conjunction with the polyfiber covering manual in the two-day fabric covering workshop will give you all the skills you need to do a safe as well as beautiful job of covering. In the basic fabric covering video, you will be learning how to cover your airplane using the polyfiber process. You may know this system better by its former name, the Stitz process. During the World War II era, airplanes were covered using grade A cotton fabric and dope. There were two big disadvantages in using this system. First, the fabric and dope combination is very flammable. Second, the butyrate dope continues to shrink with age, causing excessive stress on the airframe. Polyester fabric was introduced in the early 1960s under the DuPont trade name of Dacron. When dope was used on the new polyester fabric, an interesting and not very advantageous thing happened. The dope, as it continued to shrink over a period of time, eventually shrank itself right off the polyester fibers. Ever seen anything like this? That's dope on polyester fabric that has delaminated with age. A gentleman by the name of Ray Stitz decided this delaminating problem wasn't such a good thing. So shortly after the polyester fabric was introduced, he set about designing a system that would be compatible with the new fabric. What we have now, and will be using during this video, is the system he designed. One which does not shrink away from the fabric with age, and one which does not support combustion. After its introduction in the early 1960s, the Stitz process rapidly became the most popular covering system. It retains this distinction today under the name of polyfiber. Before we start, there are some safety issues to consider. The chemicals used in the polyfiber liquids can cause serious health problems, which could show up years after their use. So you've got to protect your skin. To avoid absorbing the chemicals through the pores in your skin, use either latex gloves or a product called invisible gloves. A little goes a long way, and you need to recoat your hands every hour or so. Don't worry, it doesn't transfer to the fabric. Breathing the fumes expended from the polyfiber liquids is not a good thing to do. So buy a hydrocarbon rated respirator and work in a well ventilated area. When spraying the liquids, you need to wear long pants and a long sleeve shirt or invest in a spraying suit. There is a suit made of paper, which is very inexpensive, that will last for your entire project if you're gentle with it. If you decide to use aerothane, a polyurethane paint, as your final color coat, you will also need to invest in some kind of fresh air source to be used when spraying it. A carbon respirator isn't sufficient to filter out the polyisocyanides contained in urethane paints. You should also keep a fire extinguisher handy at all times. And one last thing, until the solvents in the polyfiber liquids evaporate, they are very flammable. Don't ever stir them using a paddle attachment in an electric drill. The motor may spark and you have big problems. Always use air-driven tools around the polyfiber liquids. Select a well-ventilated area where fumes won't be a bother to you or anyone else in the family. A garage or empty hangar is good. A basement isn't. You'll have folks in your family asking you please to cease your activities as the fumes permeate the whole house. These are the tools you will need to cover your airplane. You'll see as we go along when each is used. Working temperatures are important. The rule of thumb is this. If you are comfortable working at a temperature, it's likely that the polyfiber liquids will work well for you. In a perfect world, the temperature would be 77 degrees with low humidity. You're not very likely to get that. Keep in mind a few simple things and you won't have too much trouble with temperature deviations. When the temperature goes up to 87 or so degrees, drying time speeds up to twice that at 77 degrees. At 67 degrees, the drying time slows down to half of that at 77 degrees. Both of these conditions can be addressed by using the proper reducers or retarders when thinning the chemicals. More about this later. 
A humidity of 80% or more can affect the liquids and cause a condition called blushing, in which water vapor condenses on the surface. If this happens, obviously you do not keep applying coats of product to your surface. You have to wait until the layer of water dries before adding another coat. If you see blushing, either use polyfiber blush retarder or wait for a less humid day. Okay, you're about ready to start recovering your airplane or building your new kit. Before you do, invite an AMP mechanic with an inspection authorization, IA rating, to lunch. Talk to this person. Tell him or her your plans. Ask how much it will cost to have enough periodic inspections to ensure a perfectly safe flying machine the day of the first test flight. Lastly, remember that whether you are building a kit or recovering a standard category aircraft, you'll need to have some paperwork completed by an authorized person before you fly. An AMP with an inspection authorization can sign a 337 major alteration form required if you are recovering a standard category airplane. If you are building a kit, you'll eventually need an airworthiness certificate. A person from the FAA or a DAR, designated airworthiness representative, will need to issue that. Either way, identify and meet with the person who will complete your paperwork before you start. Ready to begin? Let's go. We are going to use two different wings during the course of this video. One from a 1959 Piper Tri-Pacer and the other from a 1928 New Standard. We do this to demonstrate that the process and techniques in using the polyfiber covering system are the same, whether you have wood or aluminum as your structure. In addition, you will use the same steps we perform here on every surface you cover, whether it's the fuselage, tail surfaces, or ailerons. As you see, we have left the tripacer wing covered to demonstrate how to remove the old cover. When you remove old fabric from a surface, particularly wings and fuselage, try to keep it intact as much as possible. Old fabric makes a good template. It shows you where to put inspection access holes, where to cut holes in the fuselage for rudder cables, and so on. Before uncovering a surface in which there are inspection holes, look in each location to be sure there is really something there to see. Cut them all out if that hasn't already been done, and look. When uncovering wings, use a razor blade to cut fabric away from the butt rib, then trailing edge, aileron well, and wing tip. Be careful not to score the wood, aluminum, or fiberglass with the blade. Cutting the fabric off dulls the blade quickly, so change it often. You'll be glad you do. It's hard enough to get old fabric off when the blade is sharp, let alone when it's dull. Turn the wing over and do the same. The fabric can sometimes be pulled off in one piece at this point from the leading edge. This is good if you're going to copy the paint scheme onto the new cover job, and it is complicated, like many aerobatic airplanes with stars, bursts, and so forth. Once the fabric has been removed, your work really begins. You must now prepare the wing for its new fabric. It's easy to see the tripacer wing isn't ready. All this old masking tape and residue from the old coatings must be taken off. Much of it can be washed off with MEK. At times, a scotch pad is necessary, sometimes sandpaper. Do whatever you have to do to get the surface clean. Take your time. The surface must be clean and free of old flaking varnish, old primers, rust, masking tape, coatings, anything left on from the previous cover job. You get the idea. A rule of thumb you'll hear over and over during this video is this. If you can feel it, you'll see it in the end. Be sure the surface is clean. Even dirt dauber nests have to go. Before covering any structure, it should be carefully inspected throughout. This could mean taking off the leading edge, removing paint buildup from the spar ends and attach points or die checking fittings. Inspect everything. Get an a and with experience to look at the structure as well. You can't be too careful. Now's the time to catch any problems and repair them. This broken wood on the new standard wing is a good example of what you may find upon inspection. If the fabric is screwed onto the ribs, now is the time to check that the pre-drilled holes in the ribs have not been enlarged. Notice how this screw in the leading edge is spinning in the hole. The same will happen on the ribs if the hole has been enlarged. Make sure the proper size screw will tighten in each hole. Drill new holes as necessary. If the fabric is riveted to the wing, check to see if these holes have been enlarged. Fabric rivets are 1 8 inch rivets. 
To check the integrity of the existing holes, use a copper-colored Clico and make sure it holds securely. If not, drill a new hole. If the leading edge is dented, either replace it or fill the voids with superfill. Superfill is light, doesn't shrink, and is very easy to sand to the proper contour when dry. It is mixed either by volume or by weight, and then spread over the area being filled with a squeegee until smooth. Smoothing it out at this stage will reduce sanding time later. When dry, block sand until smooth. More can be added if necessary until the void is filled. When you varnish wood structures or prime metal surfaces, you must use a two-part epoxy varnish or primer on the surface wherever the fabric will touch. They are unaffected by the chemicals in the polyfiber liquids. No one-part spray-on zinc chromate, no one-part spar varnish. The chemicals in the polyfiber liquids will lift and wrinkle the one-part products. You may be sitting there saying to yourself, well, I don't know what's on there, one part or two. Here's a test. Soak a rag in MEK. Place the rag on the part in question and come back in about 15 minutes. If the primer or varnish is all over the rag, then you need to recoat with an epoxy varnish or primer. Usually, it is not necessary to remove one part varnish or primer if it is in good condition. Brushing or spraying a two part varnish or primer over the one part is okay, but do a test spot first just to make sure. If the MEK on the rag doesn't affect the primer or varnish, you're fine. Here is an area of one part zinc chromate sprayed from this can. Obviously, this isn't doing much protecting of the metal and will transfer to the fabric during the covering process. There is an excellent section in your polyfiber manual about preparing wood, aluminum, steel, and fiberglass for cover. Be sure to read pages 9 through 11. Okay, we're going to proceed as if our tri-pacer and new standard wings are clean and ready to cover. Shortly, you will be using your irons, both the big one and the little hobby iron, to install fabric and smooth wrinkles. It's time now to prepare them for use. You will need some silicone heat sink compound, a polyfiber thermometer, and your two irons. Be sure to read the section in your manual on calibrating your irons on pages 13 and 14. Put a piece of tape on the iron's temperature control so you can mark the calibrated temperatures. You'll be calibrating the irons for 225, 250, and 350 degrees. First, place some heat sink compound on the iron Put the thermometer bulb in the heat sink compound and place both on a stack of paper towels. Advance the heat control and watch the thermometer. When the iron stabilizes at 225 degrees, mark the iron. Do the same for 250 and 350 degrees, then do it all over again with the little hobby iron. You must calibrate your irons. Using a carefully calibrated iron is the only way you can be sure to control the temperature transferred to your fabric period. After the iron has cooled, be sure to clean the silicone heat sink from the bottom of the iron. The iron should be recalibrated whenever it is accidentally dropped or if you're working in an area where you have a different extension cord arrangement from the one you were using when the iron was first calibrated. Let's get back to the tripacer wing. After it is clean, smooth, and primed or varnished if necessary, you are ready to install inter-rib bracing. This has already been installed on the tripacer wing. This bracing keeps the ribs straight when the fabric is tightened over them. There is a section on page 12 of your polyfiber manual describing this step and how to install the inter-rib bracing. After this has been done, you are ready for the anti-chafe tape. This is a cloth tape you will put wherever a structural feature might chafe, poke, or cut through the fabric. High spots like rivet heads, nail heads, and screw heads get tape. Also, any hard edge like the leading edge skin on the tripacer or the wing walk on the new standard. Rolled edges, like those on the tripacer ribs, don't need tape. Where the ribs intersect the trailing edge gets a small piece of tape because of the rivets that attach the trailing edge to the ribs. Sometimes, as on this tail surface where the welded areas are nice and smooth and there are neither hard edges nor protrusions of any sort, you may not need any anti-chafe tape at all, so you'd skip this step. Use your judgment. If in doubt, put some tape. Crossing one piece of tape with another is okay, or you can use a razor blade and butt the ends using this technique. You can also use tape to build up areas, such as where the leading edge skins overlap. 
build up with thin strips and then cover the whole area with a wider piece. Once the anti-chafe tape is applied on both sides, you're ready to get out the first polyfiber liquid you'll use, polybrush. Thoroughly stir and then mix up some thinned polybrush. The recipe is three parts polybrush to one part reducer. Here is an easy way to get the proportions correct. Using a ruler, make four equal marks on a paint stick. Fill up the container with three marks worth of polybrush and pour enough reducer in to reach the fourth mark. Now, a word about the kind of reducer to use. Remember, we said you can counteract the effects of temperature with reducers. If it's hot, you'll need to thin with RR8500. Think of 85 as the degrees in which you're working. This reducer also contains some retarder to slow the drying time. If it's cool, you'll use R65-75 reducer. No retarder in this one. And if it's really humid, you'll also need some blush retarder. Directions for its use are on the can. Now, back to our wings. Brush two coats of the thinned polybrush over the entire leading edge. This provides a bed that will help the fabric adhere and also reduces the possibility of pinholes in later steps. You would also put two coats on areas like the wing walk on the new standard, a fuel tank if the fabric would come in contact with it, a turtle deck, pretty much any large metal, wood, or fiberglass parts that will be covered by fabric should get these two coats of polybrush. If you're in doubt about whether or not to pre-coat an area with polybrush, go ahead and do it. It can't hurt. Also, put some polybrush on all anti-chafe tape. This helps to keep it stuck in place during fabric installation. Let the polybrush dry about 15 minutes between coats. Time to cut the fabric. Polyfiber fabric comes in light, medium, and heavy weights and is about 70 inches wide. This is polyfiber medium weight fabric, as you can see by the stamps that appear every three feet or so. This ink will not bleed through your coatings. Roll out a piece of fabric along the wing, leaving enough at the wing root to cover the entire end and about a foot at the tip. Why so much at the tip? You'll see later. Cut another piece the same length. We're just about ready to attach the fabric to the wing. First, let's consider an issue that has to do strictly with the visual appeal of the finished product. Which side of the tri-pacer wing can best be seen when the plane is at rest? Unless you're very tall, you can see the bottom of the wing, just as you can see the top of the lower wing on the new standard or the top of the tail surfaces and so forth. Once you've considered which side you can see, determine which side of the fabric to glue on first so that when you are completely finished installing the fabric, the final glued seam is on the side you don't see. Even if the final cemented seam isn't perfect, no one will notice. On the new standard lower wing, you would want to cover the bottom of the wing first so that the top piece of fabric is wrapped around and cemented to the bottom piece on the underneath side of the wing where you can't see the final glued seam. On the tripacer, you would cement the top piece of fabric on the wing first so the bottom piece could wrap around and be glued to the top piece on the top portion of the wing, where you won't see the final cemented seam. You can use a tape measure to determine how far up on top the seam could be taken, given the 70-inch maximum width of the fabric. On the tripacer, the bottom piece of fabric can wrap all the way around the leading edge and be cut at the edge of the aluminum. This will put your final cemented seam out of view when the plane is on the ground. On tail surfaces, you would cover the bottom of the surface first so the top piece of fabric put on last will wrap around and be cemented to the bottom piece on the underneath side where you can't see the final seam. Again, this is a purely cosmetic consideration, but it is good to be thinking from the start about ways to make the finished piece not only technically correct, but also visually attractive. Back to the tripacer wing. When applying the first piece of fabric, you must cement a two inch wide area of fabric to the leading edge. That's one of the rules. Where the two inch wide area of glued fabric is located is up to you. The only requirement is that the second piece of fabric you install reach far enough around the leading edge so that you can cement it to the first piece with a two inch overlap. The fabric must be cemented to the structure around the rest of the perimeter with at least a one inch wide area of glue. There is an excellent section in the polyfiber manual on pages 17 through 24 on fabric cementing. 
On the tri-pacer, we will make the cemented seams in the center line area of the leading edge, as described in the manual. Get out your chalk line and snap a line along the center of the leading edge. Then measure one inch above the center line and one inch below the center line and snap parallel lines at those marks. Regular blue carpenter's chalk lines will disappear later and won't bleed through the final coatings. These chalk lines will be your guidelines. We'll use them later when cutting and cementing the leading edge. Position the wing top side up and place the fabric on the wing. You will now need lots of clothespins and spring clamps to clamp the fabric in place. Be sure the fabric rests smoothly on the surface and is clamped in place exactly in the position it will be cemented. You will usually have to reposition the clamps at least once before you are ready to cement. Keep at it until the fabric rests smoothly on the surface. Ordinarily, you can use clamps and clothespins to secure the tip, wing root, and trailing edge in place, as you see here on the new standard. Be sure the fabric is clamped smoothly and tightly along the trailing edge. Don't let it get bunched up like this. If it is smooth and straight along the trailing edge, you will avoid having wrinkles due to excess fabric when you turn the wing over and cement the fabric to the trailing edge. The tri-pacer with its full-length aileron well can be clamped only at the tip and wing root. Do the best you can. Never, ever start to cut or glue until the fabric is clamped in position. This is true when you are covering any structure. Notice how on this tri-pacer fuselage, the fabric was clamped into position first before any cuts were made. How tightly should the fabric be cemented? One guideline is that once you have finished cementing, the fabric should look as it did before you started cementing, resting smoothly on the surface. This is the way it is already clamped, so do not pull and tug on the fabric as you are cementing. It doesn't really matter where you start cementing, whatever seems most practical to you but always save the wingtip bow for last. On the tri-pacer wing, we are going to cement the area around the aileron well first because it can't be clamped into position due to the shape of the well. May as well cement it into position before we tackle the leading edge. Remember, you need at least one inch of fabric cemented to the structure of the wing everywhere except the leading edge where you must have a two inch wide cemented area. Adhering to this rule, the fabric will be cemented into the aileron well at least one inch. More is okay, but not necessary. Draw a line on the fabric so that at least one inch extends into the aileron well. Use only a number two pencil to mark the fabric. Anything else may bleed through to the final finish. The line and cement the fabric into the well. The procedure for cementing with polytac is to apply a wet bed of cement to the surface and press the fabric into the wet polytac. Do not go over the top of the fabric with more polytac. You want the solvents to evaporate out through the fabric. Remember, the procedure is to put a wet bed of polytac on the surface and press the fabric into the wet bed. Work with no more than a 12 inch stripe of cement at a time. You will usually use a squeegee to remove the excess cement so there are no lumps in the cemented seams. The squeegee is a little hard to use in the aileron well, though, so use your fingers to press the fabric firmly in place. We will finish off the inside of the aileron well later, when the pinked edge finishing tapes are applied. At the tip area of the aileron well, and most anywhere else where there is a 90 degree corner, draw a line at a 45 degree angle into the corner. You can also punch a little hole with your pencil at the corner to give you a guide for how far in to cut. Cut the fabric into the corner, then trace the triangular shape of the tip onto the flap of fabric. Next, we'll cement the fabric to the butt rib. Doing this now will help secure the fabric in position before turning the wing over to cement the leading edge. Depending on the shape of your airfoil, covering the butt rib should require some heat forming with the iron set at around 250 degrees. The fabric at the butt rib of the new standard requires heat forming, as you see here. You'll see this demonstrated again when we heat form around the wing tip. Cut a one inch allowance around the leading edge area. Cut little flaps and cement. Using clothespins to secure the fabric while the polytac is drying is sometimes helpful. You can get creative and use a second piece of fabric to enclose open areas if you'd like, as on the butt rib of the new standard. If it seems like a good idea to you, it probably is. On the tri-pacer, we can cover the butt rib without heat forming. 
You can cover the entire rib face except where the aileron controls come through, as we are doing on the tripacer. Cut a one inch allowance around the leading edge area, cut little flaps, and cement. Next, the leading edge. In a moment, the wing must be turned over in order to cement the fabric to the leading edge skin. You can imagine that when it's flipped over, the fabric along the leading edge is going to fall out of position. To avoid that, spot weld the fabric in place before turning the wing. Using a small dab of polytac and your squeegee, cement the fabric in place at intervals along the leading edge. This will keep it in position when we flip it over. Turn the wing. Notice how you can see the blue chalk line we snapped on the wing through the fabric. This will show you where you want to cut the fabric. Snap a chalk line on the piece of fabric that exactly corresponds to the chalk line already on the wing. Let's talk for a moment about cutting the fabric. It wants to fray badly, and if this happens and you glue it down with these frayed ends, you will forever see them in the finished piece. Remember, if you can feel it, you'll see it. If frayed edges are glued in, you can definitely feel them. There is a trick to keeping the fabric from fraying, and you should do this every time you're about to cut a piece of fabric. With a one-inch brush, coat the area you're about to cut with a small amount of poly -tack. This seals the fabric weave and will keep the fabric from fraying when it is cut. Coat the line you will be cutting with a small amount of poly -tack and let it dry. Remember, always coat any line you cut with poly -tack first to keep it from fraying. Cut on the blue line using straight scissors. Be very careful to cut right on the line. Why not cut with pinking shears? You want to hide this cut under the second piece of fabric. Since a pinked edge has about 40% more edge area than a straight cut, it is much more difficult to hide. Starting in the middle, cement the fabric to the leading edge using the chalk line previously snapped as a guide. Work in sections of not more than about 12 inches. Brush at least a two inch wide wet bed of polytac on the leading edge, press the fabric down into the polytac, and using a squeegee, remove the excess. The squeegee accomplishes two things. It presses the fabric firmly into the polytac, and it also removes any excess, keeping the glued area free from lumps. As you squeegee, put a slight side load on the fabric in the direction you're cementing, but do not pull and tug on the fabric. When you arrive at the tip end of the leading edge skin, where the wingtip starts, make a vertical cut down the leading edge material and cement that area. Leave the tip fabric loose for the moment. Last, we will heat form the fabric around the wingtip bow. Now the fabric will be pulled tight as we iron it to the contour of the tip. The iron should be set at around 250 to 300 degrees. Pull and iron towards your hand. Pull and iron towards your hand. Always iron perpendicular to the tip bow. Don't ever pull sideways. Always straight. Pull and iron towards your hand. Do a little at a time and keep at it until the fabric lies flat on the tip bow. Never mind how wrinkled it is past the area you will cement. Once it lies flat, cement the fabric to the bow. Cut off the excess and again, start cementing in the center of the area being attached. Put down a wet bed of polytac under the fabric, press the fabric into the polytac and use your hand to squeegee out the excess. Notice how this spot looks dry. There is not enough polytac under the fabric here. When you notice small spots like this, it is okay to rub some polytac through the fabric to wet the area. It should not occur very often if you are careful to put a very wet bed down before the fabric is pressed into the polytac. Carefully trim with a razor blade or scissors. This extra piece of fabric at the tip is in the way, which brings up a saying you might want to remember. If you don't like it, cut it off. Don't be afraid to cut off pieces that look like they just don't belong. Use common sense during fabric covering. Generally, if it seems right to you, it probably is. Before cementing fabric to the bottom of the wing, there is some cleanup and ironing to do. In a moment, we are going to cement another piece of fabric on top of the one we've just finished installing. Right now, if you could run your fingers over the cemented areas, you'd feel some roughness from the polytac that seeped through the fabric. Also, you'd feel some small wrinkles that occur during fabric installation. Remember, if you can feel it, 
you'll see it in the end. You must clean up the polytack and iron out any wrinkles in the cemented areas before installing the second piece of fabric. Remove the polytack with a clean rag and MEK. Be sure not to scrub the seams. That will fuzz up the edge. Always rub in the direction that causes the fibers to lie down in the seam edge. Now, smooth out any wrinkled areas with the iron set at 250. If you have a wrinkle that just won't go away at that temperature, you may turn the iron up, but be very careful. Too much heat could release the cement bond and ruin your day. The objective here is to clean up and smooth out all areas where you will be cementing the second piece of fabric onto the first. Now it's time to cement the second piece of fabric to our wing. Position the wing so the covered side is up. Iron out any additional wrinkles you see in the area where the second piece of fabric will be cemented. Never cement over wrinkles. Now we need to snap some more blue chalk lines. At the trailing edge, as would be done on the new standard wing, snap a line one inch inboard of the edge. This will give you a guideline when cementing the second piece of fabric. On the leading edge, snap a line two inches past the edge of our first piece of fabric. Again, this provides a guideline to which you will glue the next piece of fabric. Now for the bottom piece. Turn the wing over and clamp the fabric in place as before. Again, be sure it rests smoothly on the surface. Before cementing, remember to protect your hands, either with gloves or with invisible gloves cream. As before, on the tripacer, we will start cementing at the aileron well. We're starting here because we can't clamp the fabric into position due to the shape of the well, so we just have to cement it into position. Cut into the corners at a 45 degree angle. Make the pencil line, coat with polytack, cut and cement a flap at the tip area. Lay the fabric into the well. Mark where you will cut at least one inch into the well. Use the polytack so the cut won't fray. Cut and cement into the well. Notice that here the fabric is cut so that it covers the entire aileron well. This is fine, but be careful never to iron this area. If you do, the fabric can pull out of the well and chafe the aileron. Remember, don't pull and tug as you cement. Gently press the fabric into the wet bed of polytack. Cover the butt rib just as was done with the first piece of fabric. We're now ready to turn the wing over and cement the leading edge. Before doing that, spot weld the fabric in position just as you did before, using little dabs of polytack and the squeegee. Turn the wing over. Notice that through the second piece of fabric, you can see the blue chalk lines previously snapped on the wing at the trailing edge of the new standard or the leading edge of the tripacer. Snap another set of lines on the second piece of fabric that correspond to those already on the first piece of fabric, both leading and trailing edges. You'll see why shortly. Coat the chalk lines you just snapped with a little bit of polytack so they won't fray. Let that dry and then carefully cut both leading and trailing edge seams. Don't take off all the clothespins along the trailing edge as you're cutting or the fabric will fall out of position. Be very careful to make neat, straight cuts. If you do, or don't, it will show in the end. As before, where the leading edge material transitions into the tip bow, vertically cut down the edge of the leading edge material to the center line. Be sure to coat that line with polytack before cutting it so it won't fray. Now listen carefully. This is important to the overall look of your finished surface. You have a blue chalk line on the leading and trailing edges. You have a corresponding blue chalk line you have just cut on the second piece of fabric that is about to be cemented to the first. These two lines should meet when you cement the seams, no matter what. If you make these two lines meet, you will have perfectly straight seams. Again, it doesn't really matter whether you cement the leading or trailing edge first, whatever makes sense to you in order to keep the fabric in position. Cement the fabric to the leading edge with a two inch wide glue area. Start in the middle and, using the squeegee, work your way to each end using a slight sideways motion as you squeegee. Be sure to make the cut edge of the fabric to the blue line on the surface. Let's move to the new standard and cement the trailing edge. 
as always, start in the middle and squeegee using a slight sideways motion as you go along in either direction. Remember to make the blue lines meet. Don't pull and tug the fabric out of position. Gently press it into the poly pack. Keep the edge of the seam right on the blue line already snapped on the wing. This way, you will achieve a perfectly straight seam. Last thing to do, the wing tip. Here is a good example of how sometimes things get stuck down where they shouldn't be, like this area at the tip. You can break this loose with your fingers so it doesn't deform this area when you shrink the fabric later. Heat form the tip just like you did before. Pull and iron towards your hand. Pull and iron towards your hand. Keep going until there is an inch of fabric resting flat around the tip. Using your pencil and a ruler, carefully draw a line one inch in from the tip bow radius. As you know, ordinarily you would coat the line with polytack before cutting to avoid frayed edges. Let's not and see what happens. Cut the seam and cement. See how the cut edge tends to fray if it's not coated with polytack first. Now you have successfully covered the entire wing. It's time to iron after allowing the polytack to dry at least 30 minutes. Set the iron to 250 and allow time for it to heat. Now, starting at the wing tip, iron one bay. Move the iron around slowly and watch as the big wrinkles disappear. Move all the way down to the butt rib and iron one bay there. Iron the leading edge, too. Don't iron the seams. We'll take care of any wrinkles there later. At 250 degrees, the fabric will shrink around 5 to 6 percent. This is enough to get most of the wrinkles out, but only about half of the maximum amount the fabric will shrink. You want the fabric to be as tight as possible to minimize the vibration during flight. Now, back to the tip and iron the second bay in. Back to the butt end and the next bay in. Keep alternating end to end until you reach the middle, ironing the bays and leading edge. Always work end to end toward the middle. Never start at one end and go to the other. This puts too much asymmetrical force on the structure and could bend something. Not a good thing. Iron right over the fuel cap area. You can cut this out before shrinking the fabric at 350 degrees. Turn the wing over and do the same thing at 250 degrees on the other side. Iron around the strut fitting sticking up on the bottom of the wing. They won't break through. After ironing the whole wing at 250 degrees, cut the fabric just enough for the protrusion to pop through. Now increase the iron temperature to 350 degrees and carefully repeat the ironing process again. Make sure you iron every inch of the fabric. Again, don't iron over the cemented seams. A good way to know you haven't missed a spot is to place a check mark with your number two pencil in areas that have been ironed at 350 degrees. Then, if the phone rings or you get otherwise interrupted, you don't have to start all over again. At this time, do not iron the glued areas. We'll take care of them later. Turn the wing over and iron the other side at 350 degrees. This is an area that was previously spot welded to keep the fabric in position when we turned the wing over. Notice how the polytack we used is keeping the fabric from sliding across the leading edge as it is shrunk. No problem. Just wipe the spot weld off with some MEK and proceed. At 350 degrees, the fabric will shrink a total of 10 to 12 percent. This is what you're shooting for, maximum tautness. After you have finished ironing the surface, it's time again to do some cleanup, just as was done before cementing the second piece of fabric to the wing. Return the big iron to its 250 degree setting or use the little iron set at 250 degrees and take care of any wrinkles that may be in the cemented areas. Using MEK, clean off any polytack. You can definitely feel wrinkles and built up areas of polytack. Remember, if you can feel it, you'll see it in the end. In just a moment, you're going to brush one coat of poly brush on the entire surface. Before you do this, be sure the surface is clean and free of oils. Thoroughly wash the surface with MEK. Use a clean cotton rag and be sure not to flood the cement joints. After washing both sides with MEK, lightly pass a tack rag across the surface. 
Be sure not to press very hard with the tack rag. It contains beeswax that could transfer to the surface with excessive pressure. Using the same recipe of three parts poly brush to one part reducer, brush a coat over all of the fabric. The idea is to turn the entire surface pink. Applying this coat of poly brush accomplishes two things. First, it seals the fabric weave, and second, poly brush acts as a cement that soaks through the fabric and bonds the fabric to the surface. Remember that earlier, two coats of poly brush were applied to the leading edge. The poly brush now being applied will soak through the fabric and bond the fabric to the leading edge. The fabric is now sandwiched between coats of poly brush. Notice how runs are forming on the underside of the fabric. This is perfectly normal and nothing you should worry about. However, if you put so much poly brush on the surface that it drips out the other side, you've put too much. If this happens, you need to wipe the drips off with MEK and a clean rag. If you leave it, when it dries, you'll feel a small bump. Remember, if you can feel it, you'll see it in the end. Apply this coat of poly brush much as you would a coat of varnish on wood. Put on one wet coat, make a pass with the tip of the brush to remove small bubbles that will form and leave it alone. After you finish one side, flip the surface over and do the other. Remember, if some poly brush has run through to the other side, you must wipe it off with MEK before continuing. Once both sides have been coated with poly brush, you are ready to attach the fabric to the ribs. There are four commonly used methods of doing this. Rib lacing, fabric rivets, clips or screws with washers. There is an excellent section on attaching fabric to ribs in your polyfiber manual on pages 29 through 40. In this video, we'll concentrate on the rib lacing method of attaching fabric to the structure. How much space between the laces? On a certified aircraft, spacing must be the same as that which was on the airplane when it was certified and received its type certificate. This chart on page 29 of your polyfiber manual and also in the FAA's AC43.13.1A can be used if you don't know the spacing. The bottom of the chart shows the VNE speed. The left side is the maximum distance between each lace. Let's say the VNE speed or never exceed speed of the tripacer is 150 miles per hour. On the chart, draw a vertical line up from 150 until it reaches the line marked prop wash area spacing. Follow this to the left and you see that in the prop wash, spacing should be two and a half inches maximum. Continue the line vertically until you hit the line marked non-prop wash area spacing. Again, follow this to the left. This gives you a maximum spacing of three and a half inches outside the prop wash. Using your aircraft's VNE speed, you'll do the same procedure to determine the spacing. Once the spacing is determined, measure, lay out, and mark the position of the individual rib laces. Put the wing top side up. Begin measuring rib lace spacing at the butt rib, working from the aft edge of the leading edge skin where it meets the open fabric. The first rib lace is always placed at half the required distance of the others. Let's say our required distance is two and a half inches. Half that is one and a quarter inches. Place the tape on the top of the butt rib and start measuring and marking. The first mark goes one and a quarter inches back from the leading edge skin. The next mark goes two and a half inches from that mark. The next two and a half inches from there and so forth to the trailing edge. The last mark should be not more than two and a half inches from the trailing edge. Do the same thing on the rib closest to the tip bow. Get the chalk line out, find a friend, and snap lines on the top of the wing at each mark. Every place the chalk line intersects the rib, there will be a lace. Rib lacing goes through the entire wing and must be parallel to the spar face. If you had a perfectly symmetrical wing, spacing would be the same on the bottom as it is on the top. Usually though, the bottom of the wing is more flat than the top. There is a shorter distance from the front spar to the trailing edge on the bottom than there is on the top of the wing. If you didn't allow for the difference by making the spacing closer on the bottom than on the top, the laces wouldn't be parallel to the spar face. How do you adjust the spacing? You can keep the laces straight and parallel to the spar face by making a simple cardboard template. 
The procedure for creating the template is described on page 32 of your manual. Once the airfoil shape is cut in the cardboard, mark the forward spar location. Transfer the spacing marks on the top of the butt rib to the template. Lay the template on something flat. At each lace location along the top of the airfoil, draw a line parallel to the front spar extending down through the bottom of the airfoil template. This gives you the proper positions for the rib laces on the bottom. Once the template is made, turn the wing bottom side up. Use the bottom edge of the template to transfer the marks to the bottom of the wing at the butt rib and tip rib. Snap lines as you did on the top of the wing. Once the blue chalk lines have been snapped, pre-punch holes using a straight needle or small awl. Punch the holes as close to the side of the rib as possible. Going in at a slight angle helps. Punch every place you want a rib lace on both sides of the rib. Be careful to poke holes right on the blue lines. If the holes aren't punched right across from each other, the rib laces will be crooked. Once that's done, apply reinforcing tape to each rib on both sides of the surface. This tape is very important since it keeps the rib lace cord, clips, rivets, or screws from cutting through the fabric. Reinforcing tape comes in three widths, one quarter, three eighths, and one half inch. Use the size that is exactly the width of your rib. Don't use reinforcing tape that is wider than the rib. If you do, it bunches up under the stitch. Not good. You'll see that in the end. If you have a rib wider than one half inch, butt two pieces of tape together. If the area you're stitching requires tape less than a quarter inch, cut it with a straight edge and razor blade. Pre-cut each piece a little longer than necessary. They will get trimmed later. Peel off the backing and stick the tape on each rib. It should be put down straight and should fall exactly between the holes you have already punched if you are rib lacing. After all reinforcing tape is installed on both sides of the surface, you are ready to rib lace, rivet, clip, or screw the fabric to the ribs. The aluminum ribs on airplanes using screws, rivets, or clips have holes for the attachment method already drilled. By now, these holes are covered by fabric and reinforcing tape. You can feel them, though. Before installing the clips, screws, or rivets, melt through the reinforcing tape and fabric at each location with the soldering iron. You can find the holes simply by pressing on the rib and watching for the telltale indentation on the reinforcing tape. Back to rib lacing. Notice that the rib lacing cord comes in two varieties, flat and round. We'll use the round. It is slightly easier to use since it doesn't want to twist like the flat cord sometimes will. Pull off about three arm lengths of cord and thread it through the end of the curved needle. You'll see why we need a curved needle in a moment. This much cord will stitch about half a rib and is about all you can handle without getting all tangled up in the string. The starting knot is not the same as the one we'll tie for the rest of the rib. The starting knot is a square knot with a half hitch on either side to keep it from slipping. To start, Go in the first hole on the right-hand side of the rib and out through the bottom on the same side of the rib. Doesn't matter if you start at the leading edge or trailing edge. Go around the rib and come out on top of the wing. Pull the cord all the way through until about six inches is left coming out of the right-hand hole. Put the needle down. Tie a square knot right behind left and come out on the left. Left behind right, and come out on the right. If the loops in the knot will do this, you know you have successfully tied a square knot. Tighten the knot snugly against the rib and pull it to the left. Now tie a half hitch on the right side of the square knot. Take the small end and work it under the stitch. Leave a loop. Put the end of the cord back through the loop and pull snug. That is one of the two half hitches. Now move the knot to the right. Tie another half hitch on the left side of the square knot. Using the needle, go under the stitch and pull through until you have another loop. Go back through the loop and there's another half hitch. Tighten the knot and half hitches. Trim the end. Now we want to get to the spot where the next stitch will be. Go into the hole with the square knot and out where you want the next stitch. See why a needle with a curved tip is used? Try that with a straight needle. 
This is where the first modified same knot will be tied. Go down in the same hole and out the bottom on the same side of the rib. Leave a pond on the top of the wing. Not Lake Michigan, not a puddle, a little pond. And make sure the hard to pull piece of cord is on the north side of the pond. Position the pond so that the needle will come out in the pond when you come up from the other side. Now go in the hole on the other side of the rib and come out in the pond. Pull the needle and cord all the way out and throw the cord away from you. Throw it away. Rest your left hand on the cord you threw away. Move the pond toward your stomach. Using the tip of the needle, go under the pond, over the log, and pull down to form a triangle. Leave the needle in the triangle and leave your fingers on the cord you threw away. Put your thumb on the left side of the triangle. With the needle, go over your thumb, under the log, and out horizontally half the length of the needle. Pick up your thumb and pull the needle down to check for a figure eight. Let go of everything. Now, with your right hand, gently hold the cord coming out of the hole to the right and slightly elevate it. Pull the needle and excess cord through the figure eight slowly and toward your stomach. Keep an eye on that piece of cord coming through the figure eight. That piece of cord coming through the figure eight wants to tangle itself up in the knot when you pull it tight. When most of the excess cord has been pulled through the figure eight, you need to secure that piece of cord so it can't tangle up the knot. Using your left hand, hold that piece of cord tightly and parallel to the rib. Now pull the cord you have been holding in your right hand toward the right. Pull until the knot is tight. A rocking motion is helpful. Now what's left is a loop and a piece of cord. You don't want the loop, so pull on this piece of cord. Think of it as the D-looper. Done. Let's try it again. Go in the same hole where you just tied the knot and out where you want the next knot. Go down in the same hole and out the bottom on the same side of the rib. Leave a pond on the top of the wing. Not Lake Michigan, not a puddle, a little pond. And make sure the hard to pull piece of cord is on the north side of the pond. Position the pond so the needle will come out in the pond when you come up from the other side. Now go in the hole on the other side of the rib and come out in the pond. Pull the needle and cord all the way out and throw the cord away from you. Throw it away. Rest your left hand on the cord you threw away. Move the pond toward your stomach. Using the tip of the needle, go under the pond, over the log, and pull down to form a triangle. Leave the needle in the triangle and leave your fingers on the cord you threw away. Put your thumb on the left side of the triangle. With the needle, go over your thumb, under the log, and out horizontally half the length of the needle. Pick up your thumb and pull the needle down to check for a figure eight. Let go of everything. Now. With your right hand, gently hold the cord coming out of the hole to the right and slightly elevated. Pull the needle and excess cord through the figure eight, slowly and toward your stomach. Keep an eye on that piece of cord coming through the figure eight. When most of the excess cord has been pulled through the figure eight, you need to secure that piece of cord so it can't tangle up the knot. Using your left hand, hold that piece of cord tightly and parallel to the rib. Now, pull the cord you have been holding in your right hand toward the right. Pull until the knot is tight. Use a rocking motion. Now what's left is a loop and a piece of cord. You don't want the loop, so pull on this piece of cord. This is the D-looper. Now you're done. One more time. Go in the same hole where you just tied the knot and out where you want the next knot.
go back down in the same hole and out the bottom on the same side of the rib. Leave a pond on the top of the wing. Make sure the hard to pull piece of cord is on the north side of the pond. Position the pond so the needle will come out in the pond when you come up from the other side. Now go in the hole on the other side of the rib and come out in the pond. Pull the needle and cord all the way out and throw the cord away from you. Rest your left hand on the cord you threw away. Move the pond toward your stomach. Using the tip of the needle, go under the pond, over the log, and pull down to form a triangle. Leave the needle in the triangle and leave your fingers on the cord you threw away. Put your thumb on the left side of the triangle. With the needle, go over your thumb, under the log, and out horizontally half the length of the needle. Pick up your thumb and pull the needle down to check for a figure eight. Let go of everything. Now with your right hand, gently hold the cord coming out of the hole to the right and tightly elevate it. Pull the needle and excess cord through the figure eight slowly and toward your stomach. Keep an eye on that piece of cord coming through the figure eight. It wants to tangle itself up. When most of the excess cord has been pulled through the figure eight, you need to secure that piece of cord so it can't tangle the knot. Using your left hand, hold that piece of cord tightly and parallel to the rib. Now pull the cord you've been holding in your right hand toward the right. Pull until the knot is tight. Use the rocking motion. Now what's left is the loop and a piece of cord. You don't want the loop, so pull on this piece of cord. Think of it as the D-looper. When you've finished lacing a rib or you're near the end of your piece of cord, You'll want to tie off and lock the last stitch with a half hitch, like this. With your needle, go under the last completed stitch and make a loop. Go back through the loop with the needle and pull tight. Wonder what's happening inside the room? Before we stripped the old fabric from the tripacer wing, the tip area was peeled back so you could see how rib lacing looks from the inside out. Once you've finished rib lacing, you are ready to clean things up a bit. Notice that there is wax on the surface from the rib lacing cord. This should be removed with C2210 paint cleaning solvent. MEK isn't good for cleaning anymore since it will now take off the coat of poly brush applied earlier. Now is the time to trim the ends of the reinforcing tape. Trimming the ends straight is important to the overall look of the airplane, so get the chalk line out again. Snap a line where the ends should be trimmed. That way all the ends will be the same. The reinforcing tapes should be trimmed about an inch past the rib lace. Push under any knots that didn't pop beneath the surface as you were rib lacing. Make the little cord ends disappear like this. Straighten any crooked rib laces. If the cord can't be pushed straight, carefully make a tiny slit in the fabric to relieve the pressure, then push the cord straight. We are ready to prepare the wing for the finishing tapes and gussets. There is an excellent section in your manual on pages 44 through 50 that you'll want to read before applying tapes to your airplane. Let's talk a moment about finishing tapes. They come in six widths, one, two, three, four, five and six inches. There are two styles, straight, sometimes called linear, and bias. Bias is for curved areas like the wingtip. See how it stretches. Straight tapes are used everywhere else. Bias tapes have a seam about every seven feet. Do not use a piece with the seam in it. You'll see how to mate bias tape to straight tape later. Think of the finishing tape as kind of like scotch tape a sticky side and a non-sticky side. It comes out of the roll with the sticky side down. If you cut a piece, then forget how it came off the roll, just hold it up. The tape has a memory, and you can see how it was on the roll. Generally, 
The pinked edges will curve slightly downward if you apply the tapes with the sticky side down. If you apply them like this, the pinked edges will be sticking up. That will make for more work later. Where do you put finishing tapes? How wide a tape should be used? And in what order do you stick them down? As a rule of thumb, finishing tapes go wherever a hard part of the surface meets soft fabric. At the leading edge, hard, soft. At the trailing edge, hard, soft. On diagonals, if they are touching the fabric, hard, soft. On every rib. On high spots. And yes, many of these areas also have anti-chafe tape under the fabric. Finishing tapes also go over every cemented or sewn seam. How wide a piece of tape do you use? Generally, the edge of a tape should extend past the hard edge or seam you are reinforcing by about one inch. For instance, on the tripacer wing, the edge of the leading edge skin needs a finishing tape, the hard meat soft rule. Measure one inch on either side of the edge of the leading edge skin, and you see that a two inch tape would work here. At the aileron well of the tripacer, we need to extend one inch past the edge of the metal and into the aileron well. A three or four inch tape is needed here. A trailing edge tape is usually four inches wide. Why? Because if you extend one inch out from the edge on both sides and take into account the width of the edge material, anything less wouldn't usually do it. In what order do you apply finishing tapes? Plan ahead. You'll see how to do this in a moment. As a general rule, you apply the tapes so no straight cut edges are on top in the breeze. Usually, cordwise tapes are applied first, then spanwise tapes. Fabric gussets can be applied at any time it seems logical to do so. Gussets are specially shaped pieces of fabric that are cut to fit over any oddly shaped places you need to reinforce. Now let's prepare the wing for our finishing tapes. You can see that the first coat of polybrush we applied is on the underside of the fabric. There isn't much accumulated on top. Before taping, we need to apply some more polybrush to form a bed in which the finishing tapes will stick. This pre-coating of all areas where tapes and gussets go ensures that there will be enough vinyl to give a good stable bond between the tapes and the fabric. You have a choice on how to apply this bed of polybrush. You can either brush it on or get out your spray gun and spray it on. In this video, we are going to brush the bed coats on using the technique described on page 45 of your manual. Get out the polybrush bucket and fill it with polybrush. Then three parts polybrush to one part reducer. Remember, you'll be using either RR8500 or R65-75 reducer, depending on the temperature in which you are working. You will use a two-inch brush for applying the bed coat. You will use the same brush for applying the tapes. A natural bristle brush is best since you can soak it in MEK for cleaning purposes without harming the bristles. First, completely soak all reinforcing tapes with polybrush. Next, apply the bed coat where every finishing tape and gusset will go. For a first class job, you should create lines in the areas where the tapes will be applied. These lines will give you a guide for putting down a neat pre-coat of polybrush so there will be little or no polybrush buildup outside the taped areas. The lines also give you a reference when applying the tapes. Let's put a few of these lines on the tripacer wing to demonstrate. You'll need a number two pencil, a ruler, and the blue chalk line you used for marking the rib stitching. On all ribs, we will put two inch finishing tapes. At the leading and trailing edge, make pencil marks from the center of the rib out one inch in either direction. We'll snap lines with the blue chalk after getting all the measurements on the wing. At the aileron well, Mark one inch out from the edge of the aluminum at both ends of the well. In preparation for applying the bed coat at the tip, mark one inch out from the seam. Also, here at the tip, there is a diagonal touching the surface of the fabric. This needs a finishing tape. Hard meets soft rule. So let's mark one inch on either side of the center of the diagonal in preparation for putting down the bed coat here. Traditionally, a four inch tape is placed over any seam at the center of the leading edge, like the tripacer has. 
so mark two inches on either side of the seam at each end of the wing. Once all the marks are made for outlining the bed coat, whenever possible, get a friend to help you snap blue chalk lines wherever you will be brushing the bed coat. You could also use a ruler and pencil to draw the lines, but snapping them is a lot faster if you can round up a helper. Let's snap some lines now. At the ribs, the aileron well, the leading edge skin, the leading edge seam. After making guidelines for the straight tapes, decide where you need the inspection openings and mark their location on the wing. In determining the inspection hole locations, the old fabric can help. Read page 41 in your polyfiber manual for more information on the location of inspection holes. You will be placing a plastic reinforcing ring at each location you've determined requires access. Cement those on now. Using your number two pencil, trace around the inside of the ring. Get the polytac back out. Yes, the same polytac you used in cementing the fabric to the structure. Put a wet coat of polytac on the ring. Position it and then give it a little twist. Wipe off any excess polytac with a rag or your finger. Now is also the time to cement any other plastic or metal reinforcements on the surface. Cement them down just as you do the plastic reinforcing rings. Also determine now where you will need specially shaped gussets and draw their shape on the wing. For example, the tri-facer would require a gusset around the strut fittings. The easiest way to get the size and shape of these gussets is to draw an outline right on the surface with the pencil. Later, you can trace the shape you've drawn on the surface onto the piece of fabric to be cut for the gusset. Next, cut out all the specially shaped gussets. Pre-shrunk polyfiber style light one, 1.7 ounce fabric works great for these. Read pages 41 and 42 in your manual concerning pre-shrinking fabric for gussets. For inspection hole gussets, a gallon can is the perfect template. Be neat. You will see the outline of the doily even after the plane is painted. Trace the outline of gussets directly from the shape you have already drawn on the wing. All gussets will be cut using the pinking shears. After all outlines for the bed coat are drawn or snapped on the wing, it's time to get out the poly brush again. Brush the bed coat of poly brush at all locations. At the strut fitting, the leading edge seam and around the wingtip bow, the ribs, the leading edge skin, the inspection rings, and the diagonal at the tip. Everywhere you need a tape or gusset. After the bed coat has dried, you are ready to apply the finishing tapes and gussets. You will be doing this with poly brush and a two inch brush. Here's where planning is required. Let's look at the area around the wingtip. Here there are three tapes coming together, the diagonal, the rib tape, and the leading edge skin tape. The question to ask yourself is which gets put down first, second, and third so that in the end, there are no cut off edges on top. If we put the diagonal piece down first and cut off the end at the edge of the rib, the rib tape will then cover that cut off end. If the rib tape went down first and the diagonal second, the cut off end of the diagonal would be on top. Remember, you don't want any cut off ends on top. So, let's put the diagonal on first. Put a little dab of poly brush in the middle of the tape to hold it in position. You will notice that all the tapes are cut a little longer than necessary and will be trimmed as we go along. Mark and trim the ends of the tape. One end is trimmed at the edge of the reinforcing tape on the rib and the other at the radius of the tip bow. Why at these particular spots? If you can make a cut where there is already an existing visible edge in the piece, you'll never be able to see your cut edge. See how nicely the one end tucks right into the edge of the rib reinforcing tape? Stick the tape down like this. Put a wet bed of poly brush down under the tape. Lay the tape in the wet bed. Scrape off the brush. Press the tape into the wet bed and remove the excess around the tape edges. Then get out of there. Don't fiddle with the tape edges. The iron will take care of any problems. You'll see more on this later. The leading edge skin tape will go down before the rib tape, so the cut end will be under the rib tape. Again, put down a wet bed of poly brush, lay the tape in the wet bed, scrape off the brush, 
Press the tape down in the wet bed. Remove the excess around the edges of the tape. Don't fiddle with it. Let's do some rib tapes. Again, notice how the tapes are cut a little long and will be trimmed later. Position the tape centered on the rib. Lay a wet bed of poly brush down under the tape. Lay the tape in the wet bed. Scrape off the brush. Press the tape down. Remove the excess around the tape edges and get out of there. Don't skimp on the poly brush. Lay the tape into the wet stripe of poly brush. It should immediately soak up into the tape. Scrape the brush dry and use it as a tool to press the tape into the stripe of poly brush. Work out the excess poly brush, remove any buildup along the edges and stop messing with it. Work fast. If you fiddle with the area too long, you will leave noticeable brush marks. Also, be careful to keep the wet coat of poly brush inside the guidelines you've drawn or snapped with the chalk line. Don't worry about air bubbles around the rib stitching or any pinked edges that might be sticking up. Again, those will be taken care of later with a little hobby iron. This is a false rib. Whenever you have a spot where a tape ends on soft fabric, cut a teardrop shape in the end of the tape. Extend the teardrop about an inch past the end of the hard area. Here, the other end will be cut off at the radius. Notice how this tape will put on now at the tip rib covers the cut ends of the diagonal and leading edge tape. That's the All cut ends under another piece of tape. The leading edge seam tape will follow the blue chalk line we previously snapped. You can put on one side of the tape now and then finish it up when the wing is turned over. The straight tape will be trimmed at the edge of the leading edge skin in keeping with the idea that if you can make your cut where there is an existing visible edge on the structure, you will never see your cut. It will blend right in. Now for the wing tip. We are going to lap a piece of bias tape over the straight tape. Before doing that, iron out any wrinkles in the area to be lapped. Cut a piece of bias tape slightly longer than you need to go around the tip bow and onto the leading edge skin so it will overlap the straight tape one to two inches. Using the pinking shears, cut a teardrop shape at one end and with your poly brush, attach it to the center line of the leading edge and overlapping the straight tape. Let that dry. Pull it around the wing tip and clamp it at the trailing edge. Center the tape on the tip bow. Run a bead of poly brush along the center line. Let that dry. Using the squeegee to lift up the loose area, apply poly brush under the tape, dry off the brush, press the tape into the poly brush, wipe off the excess. That's all there is to it. Don't worry about things like this air pocket under the bias tape. A little iron will take care of that later. Lastly, apply the doilies and gussets you previously cut. Apply the doilies to the rings like this. Position the doily centered on the ring. Lift up one side and apply poly brush in the middle of the ring. Place the doily in the poly brush and brush out the excess. Take a dull pencil and mold the fabric into the edge of the ring until it sticks on its own. Do all the rings like this, then come back and stick the doilies down around the outside of each ring after the center area has dried. Don't worry about the pencil marks. It looks much more professional if the fabric is tucked in tight against the sides of the rings. The same technique should be used when poly brushing gussets to any plastic or metal reinforcement that is on top of the fabric. Since the polyfiber STC allows for melting drain holes alone without the use of drain grommets, we will not apply grommets to the tri-pacer. If you elect to do so, read page 51 in your polyfiber manual. We will burn drain holes after the last coats of poly spray have been applied. After all the tapes have been applied and allowed to dry, brush a final coat of poly brush reduced three to one over the top of each tape and gusset. This helps avoid pinholes later. Allow this last coat to dry completely, then move on to the next step, heat smoothing. If you do this properly, you will have very little sanding to do later. Take your time. To heat smooth this wing carefully would take the better part of a day. Using the little iron set at about 225 degrees, iron every single pinked edge of every single tape. Iron around the rib stitches where there might be some air trapped. Iron out any wrinkles and bubbles in the finishing tapes. 
iron the seam edges under the finishing tapes. This will flatten the edge slightly and make the seam less noticeable. Iron out lumps that formed in the polytack during the step in which you applied the fabric to the structure. In other words, you are now going to make the entire structure smooth and imperfection free. Don't stop until the surface passes this test. Close your eyes and run your hand across the entire surface, every inch. You shouldn't feel any roughness anywhere. If you do, stop and take care of it with the iron or a little MEK. Careful here. If the iron is too hot, the tapes will shrink. These tapes are made out of the same fabric that you used to cover the structure. They will shrink 10 to 12% at 350 degrees. After you've finished heat smoothing, all the hard work is done. Before moving on to the next steps, spraying more poly brush and then poly spray, the UV protection, let's take a look at covering control surfaces and the fuselage. There is an excellent section in your manual on pages 59 through 65 that also discusses this. Ailerons are like little wings, so nothing is different except that their narrow width gives you the option of using one piece of fabric instead of two and have a glued seam only at the trailing edge. Tail feathers are covered in much the same way as wings and ailerons. They will have a one inch fabric to fabric lapped seam. No need for any two inch seams like there are on the leading edge of a wing. Most tail feathers are made of tubing and the seams will always be made over these. Depending on the width and shape of the surface, you can cover them with one or two pieces of fabric. We'll cover this horizontal stabilizer and demonstrate using one piece of fabric. Start by laying enough fabric out flat on a large work table to cover both sides of the stabilizer. Rest the stabilizer vertically on its straight hinge edge in the middle of the fabric. With the number two pencil, mark on the fabric where the hinge points are. Using a sharp razor blade, Carefully make small cuts at the marked locations to allow the hinges to poke through. Do not cut off the little flaps yet. After shrinking the fabric, you will know exactly how much to trim. Using a little poly tack, cement the fabric to the straight edge tubing. Lay the stabilizer flat on the table with the bottom of the stabilizer resting on the fabric. Cement the bottom fabric to the straight side of the stabilizer and trim with a sharp razor blade. Heat form the bottom fabric around the remaining curved area of the stabilizer. Clip around the ribs and other obstructions so you can wrap the fabric neatly around the tubing. Draw a line where you want to trim, allowing at least a one inch wrap if possible. If the tubing diameter isn't large enough to accept a one inch glued area, trim to allow for the most you can get. Cement to the tube using your fingers to press the fabric in place and force the poly tack through the fabric. Now one side is complete. Clean up any drips and roughness from the polytack seeping through the fabric with MEK. Smooth any wrinkles with the iron before cementing the top fabric to the bottom. Turn the stabilizer over so the covered side is up. Before proceeding, do a little shrinking on this side at 250 degrees to create a firmer surface on which to cement the one inch seam. It is a lot easier to make a neat seam if the fabric you're cementing to is flat and firm. Using the pencil, mark the location for cuts in the fabric for the straight edge. Put a small line of poly tack on the pencil line so it won't fray, cut, and cement. Now heat form the second side around the tube. Mark the one inch seam allowance from the center of the tube, coat the line with a small amount of poly tack so it won't fray when cut, and trim. Starting in the center, cement your seam and don't forget about the squeegee. Done. The rest is easy. You know how to complete the stabilizer because you've already done all the steps on the wing. Here are the steps again. Iron both sides at 250 degrees, ironing from end to end towards the middle. Don't iron the cemented seams. Iron both sides at 350 degrees. Put a check mark on the bays when you're finished with each. Wash with MEK. Brush with one coat of poly brush.
put down reinforcing tapes and rib stitch. Apply finishing tapes. The one big question mark that's left is how to cover the fuselage of a cabin type airplane. Let's take a look at that now. Your polyfiber manual has a section on this on pages 61 through 65. This is the fuselage of a tripacer. We are going to partially cover one side using the blanket method. That, you remember, is the method using pieces of fabric cut from the roll rather than a pre-sewn envelope. Think of the fuselage as a series of flat planes. The basic idea is to cover those flat planes by rolling out the fabric in a series of pieces and joining them with one inch overlap cemented seams. You can see that the belly of the fuselage has already been covered and we have tightened the fabric slightly using our calibrated iron set at 250. As is always the case, you must cement fabric to the structure of the aircraft and the fuselage is no different. Structure in a fuselage is defined as longerons or cross tubes only. Formers and stringers don't count as structure. You have to plan it so that you jump from structure to structure with your seams, always keeping in mind that the fabric is a maximum of 70 inches wide. Ordinarily, the belly of a fuselage is covered first and the fabric is cemented around the bottom longeron tubing on both sides. This is done just as you did with the stabilizer, rolling the fabric as far around the tubing as possible and using your fingers to press the fabric into the cement. The fabric is then tightened with the 250 degree iron to provide a firm area on which to cement the next pieces of fabric that will cover the fuselage sides. When the fuselage has a structural tube going down the center of the cabin roof all the way to the tail, typically the sides will be cemented to this tube. If there is no structure, but simply a stringer in this location, such as on the tripacer, a sewn envelope is a good alternative. We will look at both. For purposes of illustration only, we will consider that this tripacer fuselage has a structural tube running down the spine. In reality, you could not cover this fuselage in the manner you're about to see, since this is only a stringer, not a structural tube. Now let's cover one side of the fuselage. Remember that before you ever cement any fabric to any surface, you want to use spring clips and clothespins to secure it in place. The fuselage is no different. Starting at the vertical tail post or cabin area and working your way in either direction, use whatever is necessary to attach the fabric securely before ever cutting any area that will be cemented. You will, however, have to cut holes in the fabric where the stabilizer is attached and any other locations necessary for the fabric to conform to the fuselage shape and not be held off the structure. Next, make cuts at every location necessary to make the fabric conform to the tubing. Keep adjusting the clothespins and spring clamps until you get the fabric clamped smoothly on the surface exactly where you want to cement it. You want to get everything in position and trimmed before any polytack is applied. Where the fin transitions into the fuselage spine, cut little by little until you have notched enough to clothespin the fabric smoothly around the tubing. You'll have little flaps holding the fabric here. At the window area, cut into the corners at a 45 degree angle just as you know how to do from the wing aileron well. As always, clothespin everything into position first. Eventually, we'll use a putty knife to force the fabric into the window track after applying some polytack to the area. Again, as you can see, it is a matter of cut and clip the fabric in place. Cementing is simple after that. Once the fabric is completely attached with clips and clothespins, you are ready to cement it to the structure. Since it is already secured at every location, where you begin to cement makes no difference, whatever seems best to you. At the tail post, for instance, you will wrap the fabric around as far as you can, just as on the stabilizer. Use your fingers to press the fabric into the wet polytack. Cementing to the belly is no different from cementing a one inch seam on the wing. Draw a pencil line at least one inch past the center line of the tube, coat the line with polytack, let it dry, cut the seam neatly and cement. Starting in the middle, cement about 12 inches at a time using the squeegee to press the fabric into the wet polytack. Continue cementing until the fabric is completely attached to the fuselage structure. 
Where inspection openings are required, many aircraft manufacturers supply you with plastic or aluminum reinforcements like this one. These are applied with polytac after the fabric is shrunk and the first coat of poly brush is applied, as was done on the wing with the round inspection hole reinforcements. As with any reinforcement applied to the fabric, you would then need to cut a specially shaped gusset to go over the plastic reinforcement. You would draw the shape right on the fabric one inch past the edge of the reinforcement. Trace the outline on a piece of the lightweight fabric, then cut with the pinking shears. The second piece is attached in the same way, clamped into position, cut where necessary to conform to the fuselage shape, then cemented to the first pieces of fabric all around the structure with one inch glue seams throughout. For example, at the tail post, we will mark a one inch seam allowance with the pencil, coat the line with polytac so it won't fray, let the polytac dry, cut and cement. The alternative to the blanket method for a fuselage is buying or making an envelope. This envelope for the tripacer is installed starting from the back and sliding it forward. Once the envelope is on, it too is clamped into final position before any cementing takes place. Once the fabric is fully cemented to the fuselage, the steps after that are exactly the same as on any other surface. Now it is time to move on to spraying the next coatings. After the finishing tapes have been applied, the tape edges smoothed out with the little iron and so forth, it's time to start spraying. We will be demonstrating the rest of the polyfiber process using the horizontal stabilizer covered earlier in the video. Read pages 75 through 77 in your manual before starting to spray. These pages discuss in detail the type of equipment to use when spraying, as well as points on cleanliness and mixing. The first coating to spray is more polybrush. The idea here is to get enough polybrush on the surface to get a slight gloss on the finishing tapes. First, prepare the polybrush by thinning it three parts polybrush to one part reducer. Pour it into the spray gun through a 60 by 48 mesh paint strainer. If you've never painted before, we strongly suggest that you practice on something besides your airplane. Old wall paneling, an old door, whatever you can find. Practice with the piece positioned vertically and horizontally. Learn everything about your spray gun system before trying it out on the plane. Before spraying, clean the surface with C2210 paint cleaning solvent. Be very careful not to wet the tape edges. If you do, they may lift. If this happens, iron them back down before continuing. Wipe the surface gently with the tack cloth. Position the surface horizontally if possible. This will help to avoid runs. We are going to apply one mist coat and two full coats of poly brush to the surface of this stabilizer. Again, the objective is for the finishing tapes to show a slight gloss. Start by spraying the mist coat over the entire surface. Begin with the perimeter and go all the way around the piece. A mist coat will just barely put a fine layer of poly brush over the surface without looking wet. You do this by moving the gun with enough speed over the surface to prevent a lot of concentration. Or you can do the same thing by lightening the trigger pull on your gun. The idea is to spray an even, light, and level coat of poly brush over the entire surface. Notice how you pull the trigger and stop. Pull and stop. Pull and stop. Pull and stop. Each pass overlaps the last one by about 30%. The gun is always held parallel to the surface. After about 15 minutes, respray over the mist coat. This time you will put on enough poly brush to look wet and shiny like the surface of a pond on a windless day. Again, start with the perimeter. Now for the technique of cross coating. First, go down the entire surface in one direction, in this case, parallel to the ribs. It really doesn't matter which direction you start, parallel or perpendicular to the ribs. Once this first coat is tacky and the poly brush doesn't come off on your finger if you touch it, you can spray the second coat. Here's how you cross coat. Remember, spray the perimeter first. The first coat was sprayed parallel to the ribs. The second coat will be sprayed perpendicular to the ribs. Crossing the first coat is cross coating. Your polyfiber manual describes cross coating as painting one coat east-west and the next coat north-south. Good way of looking at it. 
One cross coat is two coats of paint, one coat east-west and the other north-south. If you notice small bubbles forming as you spray, you must stop and take care of them. Brush them away with the tip of a small brush. Keep brushing until they stop forming. It may be necessary to dip the end of the brush in a little MEK so it will slide over the surface more smoothly. Next, it is time for some poly spray, the UV protection. Poly spray also provides a sandable fill coat for the color coats that follow. The aluminum powder in poly spray settles out very quickly, so you'll need to mix it thoroughly before thinning and then spraying it. Poly spray is thinned four parts poly spray to one part thinner. Remember, use the appropriate thinner for the temperature. It is sprayed just the same as poly brush using the cross coat procedure. The plan is to spray two cross coats or four total coats, sand, then spray on one more cross coat. As always, before beginning to spray, clean the surfaces with C2210 paint cleaning solvent and wipe it lightly with a tack cloth. Pour the thinned poly spray through a filter as you put it in your gun. Start with the perimeter each time you spray a coat. Apply one cross coat and let it dry. Don't try to do both cross coats in one day unless you're in a big hurry. If necessary though, you can spray one cross coat in the morning and one in the afternoon. You must allow enough time between cross coats for the solvents to evaporate. Once both cross coats have been sprayed and the surface has been allowed to dry overnight, lightly sand large open areas of fabric and the edges of all pink tapes and doublers. A lot of sanding shouldn't be necessary if you've been careful with all of the previous steps. Wet sanding is recommended using 320 or 400 grit sandpaper. Be sure to clean off the sanding residue as you go along with a sponge and clean water. Be careful with the sandpaper. It doesn't take much pressure to sand through all the coatings right down to the fabric and fuzz it up. Don't ever sand over a hard object like rivets, screws, or rib lacing, over hard edges like the leading edge skin or trailing edge. After the surface has been sanded, prepare it for the last cross coat of poly spray by cleaning the entire unit with C2210 paint cleaning solvent and then running a tack rag lightly over the surface. Spray one more cross coat on the entire surface. Once the last cross coat has dried, it's a good time to heat up your pencil tip soldering iron and burn drain holes on the bottom of your surface. These are required to be one quarter inch in diameter. If you have elected not to use drain grommets, the simplest way to get perfectly rounded, neat holes that are in a straight line is like this. First, using your straight needle or a little awl, determine the lowest point at the intersection of the trailing edge and rib. Make a small hole there. Next, measure this distance and draw a line with your number two pencil at each location where you want a drain hole. Use the needle or awl to punch a small guide hole at each location. Although you are only required to have one hole per bay, we are going to put drain holes on each side of every rib. That is also acceptable and will provide more circulation of air inside the surface. Put the soldering iron into a guide hole and leave it long enough for the fabric and coatings to melt. Remove the soldering iron and immediately insert the end of your pencil. Allow the area to cool a few seconds and remove the pencil. A perfect one quarter inch hole. Be sure and wipe the tip of the iron before burning each hole. Drain holes are burned before the color coat is applied. If you burn them after painting color, when you pull the soldering iron out of the hole, a rim of silver poly spray will be pulled out onto the color. Congratulations, you are finished with the covering steps. Now, onto painting the color coats. Be sure to read pages 75 through 88 in your polyfiber manual concerning the color coats before beginning. The first decision you will have to make is what kind of paint you want to use. This boils down to a question of how you want the airplane to look. A glossy, shiny, wet look, or a more traditional satin finish. And what kind of use or abuse the airplane will get. If you want the airplane to have a semi-gloss, antique-like finish, you will be spraying polytone as your final color coat. 
If you want the airplane to have a wet look, high gloss finish, you will be spraying aerothane, a polyurethane paint. There are pros and cons to using either, and these are clearly outlined in your polyfiber manual. No matter what your selection, polytone or aerothane, you need to have a good spray rig and an appropriate place to spray. Regardless of the kind of spray system you use, you will need two different needle-nozzle-air cap combinations if you're going to use aerothane as your final color coat. Polybrush and polyspray can be applied in much more volume than aerothane, so you can use a wider needle-nozzle-air cap combination. HVLP, high volume, low pressure systems, can be run from a compressor, or you could invest in a turbine-powered HVLP system. These are advantageous since they produce much less overspray mist in the air and put more paint on the surface. Where to paint? Having the right environment in which to spray is important when using polytone and downright critical if using aerothane. Either way, your best bet is to construct a simple paint booth. Read pages 76 and 77 in your polyfiber manual for ideas on this. You could also rent or borrow a professional paint booth but be sure you can leave the surfaces you paint in the booth until they are dry. In other words, overnight. Okay, you have a good paint rig. You have taken our advice and practiced with it until you have a pretty high comfort level and consistent results. You have built a paint booth in the hangar or garage. You are ready to paint. You're ready to begin the always interesting and sometimes frustrating experience of applying color coats. Think about this for a moment. Some of your airplane, the fabric parts, are silver. Some parts, the aluminum, are probably primed in green or brown. Maybe fiberglass parts are tan. In other words, if you leave things the way they are, you are going to paint the first color coat over different base colors. These different base colors will cause a slightly different tone in the final color coat unless you apply a lot of paint to each piece. The idea, though, is to paint as few color coats as possible to get coverage and a consistent tone over the whole airplane. What can you do to solve this? Start with an entirely white airplane. Everything. Aluminum, fabric, fiberglass, the works. Here's how. On the aluminum and fiberglass, prime with Polyfiber EP-420 Epoxy Primer. It comes in white. That takes care of all the parts that aren't fabric. Spray one light coat of white polytone on all the fabric parts. Now every piece of the plane starts out the same, white. This will give you better coverage in fewer coats and a much brighter color tone, particularly if you are spraying colors other than the whites. We are going to spray some orange polytone on the stabilizer so you can see how the final product will look. Mixing any paint is critical. If you don't get all the pigment off the bottom of the can and into suspension before spraying, the paint won't be the color you want, and different spray days will result in different colors from the same can if it isn't mixed completely every time you use it. You must use a paint shaker. If you don't know someone around the airport that has one, take your paint to the automotive paint store or hardware store and have it put on a double action paint shaker for at least five minutes. Use it within a week of shaking. Ready to spray? As always, first clean the entire surface with C2210 paint cleaning solvent and gently wipe it with a tack cloth. Thin polytone, four parts polytone to one part reducer. As before, use either RR8500 or R65-75 depending on the temperature. Use blush retarder if it's humid. Pour polytone into the paint gun cup through the 60 by 48 mesh strainer. One of the very good things about polytone is that it sprays exactly like polybrush and poly spray. You've already got this all figured out. Just as with all the other coats you have sprayed, start with the perimeter of the piece, then spray a mist coat on the main surface. When the mist coat is dry, spray a wet color coat. Try to spray just enough to wet the surface uniformly without flooding it. Let the first coat dry and do it all again. Two coats may be enough, three at the most. Remember, the object is to apply the minimum number of coatings to do the job. Polytone is very flexible, but even it will crack if it's really piled on. After reading the section in your polyfiber manual on color coats, you may elect to use aerothane, 
or a combination of polytone and erythane. Your choice. Just remember to practice first until you can get a good looking job whether the practice piece is positioned vertically or horizontally. Whether you use polytone or erythane, before taping and spraying any trim colors, let the paint dry at least 12 hours. Let's take the stabilizer for one burst just to show how it's done. Start with the best fine line tape available. 3M brand is excellent. Fine line tape comes in a variety of widths and two types, green and blue. Green is for taping off straight lines and blue is used for curves. Never ever use paper masking tape for taping trim colors. It gives a very fuzzy edge to the paint line. Paper masking tape is handy though for making sure long lines, such as the one for our burst, are straight. Here's a technique for long straight lines, particularly when they cross rib lacing, rivet heads, or screws. One edge of the burst will start here and end here. If a piece of fine line tape were stuck at one end and pulled tight to the other, like this, ensuring the line would be straight, the tape wouldn't lie flat over the bumps created by laces, rivets, and so forth. See how the tape lifts up around protrusions? This would be a huge problem. Paint would blow under every place where the tape isn't stuck and make a real mess. Rather than put the fine line tape down first, Pull a piece of paper masking tape on one side of the fine line tape location. See how you can put a lot of tension on the masking tape, keeping it straight. Stick it down and eyeball the line to make sure it is straight. Now, inch by inch, lay a piece of the fine line tape along the edge of the paper masking tape. Do not put tension on the fine line tape. Be sure to press it firmly around lumps. Once it is in place, pull off the paper masking tape. This technique isn't necessary if you're pulling a piece of fine line tape over an area where there are no lumps like screws, rivets, or laces. Over smooth areas, you can put tension right on the fine line tape to keep it straight. Let's look at what to do at the curved areas of the stabilizer. Determine where you want the burst color to end and simply put a piece of blue fine line tape along the edge. Before you paint, be sure to press the areas down where any tapes cross each other. This is an area where paint will blow under if the joint isn't tight. 